Hi class, so this is the lecture for chapter 12. We're now on to social psychology. Again, you've got a lot of information in your Canvas modules to go from, so this is just a quick kind of overview introduction to the chapter. Uh, so when we talk about social psychology, we're going to be talking about attitudes and actions, attributions, um, that's why we judge things, rationale for things, um, and then we're going to talk quite a bit about social influence in this chapter. If you like this chapter, you could take a whole course on social psychology. Uh, so attitudes and actions, again, we're looking at how we can be influenced by others. Uh, and so um, I can, again, it's going to connect with attributions. I can see someone kind of give me a mean look or have their arms crossed and looking uncomfortable. I may make an attribution that person is um, rude versus, which is kind of a trait or dispositional attribution, versus saying um, that individual must be having a hard day and more of a situational context attribution. We also get a lot of our attitudes and judgments from prior knowledge, prior experiences, um, and they can also be learned. So things to think about as well. When we think about attitudes, we're going to, just like we had mentioned this with stress, we're going to have a cognitive component, how you think about things, again, your beliefs and judgments, attributions. You're also going to have an emotional component. You're also going to have a behavioral component. Um, and so my example on the slide just goes through, if I thought about exercise, if I had a positive attitude for exercise, I might be talking about cognitively thinking about how it's good for my health, the benefits that it has, releasing endorphins, helping with stress. I could also think about the emotional component. Oh, I want to exercise because I just feel so much better after I exercise. And then the behavioral component. Again, if I have a positive attitude towards exercising, then I'm going to want to do it more often. When we think about attributions, again, we can make judgments for individuals. We typically can divide it into two categories, a trait or dispositional attribution, which is more of it's the person versus the context or the situation. The context or situation we call situation attribution. Typically, when you have a lot of success, you tend to think of that as you, your hard work, your traits, your dispositions leading you towards that success. And then, um, on the opposite side of this, when we have failures, we typically have a failure. It was contextual. It was the situation I was in. I was really sick, so I couldn't study. Um, and so that's a self-serving bias. The other thing that we might do is um, we all actually often do the opposite for others, and we call that fundamental attribution error. And so I gave you kind of this joke of the cartoon of um, if I make the coffee, um, it's because I'm a bad cook um, and I can't make coffee talking to that person like it's a treat. I'm a bad coffee maker. But if you are thinking the coffee sucks and you made it, again, that self-service bi bias, you think it was the coffee and not the treat of the person making it. So we call that fundamental attribution error. Same thing if I see someone being a bad driver. I might say they are actually a bad driver versus, wow, that must per person must be in a hurry or must be having lots on their mind in that particular situation. Um, your book also gives you the example with a uh, relationship with the observer, um, actor observer bias. You can see that. The other thing that's a big deal um, talking about social psychology is cognitive dissonance. And so cognitive dissonance is when you know something is unhealthy or bad for you or you know there's bad things about the situation yet you have that behavior so um, some of the examples you get that were given for your book like I might know all these reasons why smoking is bad for me yet I'll still smoke in those situations having that kind of disconnect we can call um, cognitive dissonance where I'm kind of removing myself knowing that's bad and having that habit so cognitive dissonance is also discussed in your chapter. Uh, I will briefly talk about, because I know some of you are interested in uh, business and marketing and advertising, um, there's different ways of persuading others. And so it also depends on, do you want this to be a long lasting decision that they've made that you've changed their minds or do you just want this to be temporary? And so the book refer 
refers you to that as well, though I'm not going to ask you about this. I thought it was important to include. Um, when we do try to persuade others, I also wanted to kind of introduce you to a common technique, a foot in the door technique. This is where you typically ask a small request um, and then have that turn into a large request. Sometimes it's also you just sit, um, will ask, they'll ask for something larger and then come back with something smaller and then you feel like, oh, well, that's not so bad. I can do that. Um, so that's the foot in the door technique. Uh, again, connected to marketing and sales. We're going to talk a little bit more about social influences now, this last little bit. Conformity is when we are changing how we behave um, because we want to feel like we either fit in or we want to feel like we're in the know. Others are doing it, so it must be something we're doing. And so that's this idea of conformity. Uh, if you add power dynamic to that, where you have a threat of um, getting punished or being rewarded, we then call that obedience, and I'll talk about obedience as well. So some of the classic study that has been done on conformity is a simple line study we call it the ASH study, ASH is who first started it. You think you're part of a visual study where you're just comparing lines. Little do you know there's confederates or um, kind of actors in the group, and you are the only participant, and those actors tell you the wrong answer. So if you asked in this example, um, which line of these comparison lines matches the standard line. Well, everyone before you would be saying one. And then you've got to figure out, well, am I going to say two? Because that's the obvious correct answer. Am I going to say one to fit in? And they'll do several trials of this. And you see, even if individuals start saying the right answer, by the third trial, they're, they're switching it. And again, it's this idea of peer pressure, this idea of conformity. Um, so your book had given you the example of this as well. Uh, and so it's really remarkable because there's, back when this was studied, they were like, well, you're not getting reward or punishment. You didn't get any feedback from the others. They just were told, you know, say the wrong answer. But yet, people are changing their minds. And so then they go through after the experiment and ask them, well, what's going on? So here's a quote from one of um, Ash's actual participants. So he said, here was a group. They had a definite idea. My idea disagreed. That might arouse a anger. I was standing out like a sore thumb. I didn't want to make a fool of myself. I felt I was definitely right, but I didn't, um, they might think I was peculiar. Again, that idea of um, wanting to belong, that need of belonging is one reason why we can conform. And when we think about conformity, it happens a lot, like in classroom settings. You kind of learn those social rules for being in a classroom, and then you kind of conform to those. Um, so that's one reason we um, can conform, and, that, and we connect that with a normative social influence, the idea of I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do so I don't stick out like a sore thumb, or so I see others see me as a like, like, them um, or I'm avoiding being rejected. I'm, I'm being liked. Um, there's other reasons we might conform as well and that's when we are seeing other situations and we're wanting to be in the know, be right. Um, so there could be a case where you're in an ambiguous situation. Um, maybe the teacher is showing up late um, and it's you know been 10 minutes. Well if p other people get up and leave that might be your informative informative social influence, you decide, well, okay, everyone's leaving, I'm going to leave. Um, so again, when you're conforming based on information, we call that informational social influence. Um, with the ASH study, you could see there's a lot of different things that can make you feel like you are more likely to conform and more likely to say that wrong answer because everyone else is saying it. And so this is some of those reasons. So if the group was in unanimous, they're all saying one, even though the right answer is two, that puts more pressure on you. There's at least three people in that group before you. Um, if you admire the people in the room and, and find them attractive in some sort of quality, um, if they're, if your behavior is being observed, so versus kind of we're all right now, you're telling me if this study was done online versus you all being in the same room. Um, and then there's also those cultural differences for a collectivistic culture, an individualistic cl culture. We see collectivistic cultures really conform more. And those two cultures are discussed in your chapter as well. 
Um, so all of those are kind of that idea of that normative social influence. I'm now going to spend a couple minutes talking about um, different ways we change when in the presence of others. The first one is social facilitation. That's this idea that I'm going to do better because others are watching me. So uh, you per might perform better in a game versus practice. That social facilitation or I tend to run a little faster, or jog a little faster on a street. That's more populated than one that's a side street and not many people are going to see me. Social loafing. Social loafing is the moocher, the group moocher, the person in the group that's just riding along, riding on the curtails, that's social loafing. Now you know the official name for that. Um, group polarization is this idea where you've got a group of people, they all have like-minded ideas and their ideas are going to become more and more extreme because everyone who's like-minded is together. Um, so that's this idea of group, group polarization. So um, I'm going to put a bunch of people who are together, like they're all Republicans or they're all Democrats and all the Repu Republicans are in a group discussing. They're going to become more and more strongly viewed their Republican views. If I had a group of Democrats all together, they're going to become more and more strongly viewed um, like-minded. So that's this idea of group polarization. You're seeing more extremes um, between those two differing opinions. When we talk about um, group think, group think is another thing where under peer pressure, under tight stressful situations, quick time situations, people rush to make decisions and don't always consider the consequences. Um, so that's group think and those are some historical examples of group think. Um, and then de-individualization is this idea where you lose, you almost are anonymous. There's a whole mob of people, like a mob behavior. And so you all are acting crazy. Um, so if you want to click on that link with the slides, you could. But basically, um, mob mentality sometimes happens when there's big sports wins. People just rush to the field and start pulling out the... Um, goalpost or um, doing crazy things you normally wouldn't do. Again, this is that idea of de-individualization. You feel anonymous. There's so many people doing some crazy things. Again, that mob mentality. Okay, so the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to talk about this idea of obedience. So um, the key obedience study was Milgram study. Again, you can click through your PDF slides. You can click in a watch an original clip if you want, but he just wanted to see why do people conform? And so this was around the time of um, where we had the Holocaust. And so Milgram was trying to figure out why do we do this? So he had a Confederate, someone who did not get shocked, but as a participant, you thought they get shocked, and so those are the levels of shock. And they basically went to see how far would they go. And it was this learner study where you thought you were teaching someone something, and then every time they missed it, they got shocked. Again, those shocks, they saw how powerful those were. Again, the person really wasn't being shocked, but you thought they were. How far would they go? So you could see in his original study, 65% of the participants went all the way to the XXX, or sorry, the severe shock. And the severe shock, the learner is silent, and again, it's a really um, intense um, shock. Um, and so they just wanted to know, how, how is this? How can these Americans be doing this? Um, and again, this is the idea of conformity and power. You have a power dynamic over you. So Milgram did this study a number of different ways to kind of identify, well, what makes people more obedient or not? And so one of them is closeness to that authority figure. One of them is um, if you saw someone saying, no, this is wrong, I'm not hurting this person, before you went and were the participant, um, where you had to shock people and be the teacher, you saw that they were more likely to disobey because they saw someone else standing up, and so that gave them that power to stand up. So again, watch some of those clips and read some of that in your OpenStax. Again, that's a kind of a key classical study. Um, of course, we've got ethics going on there. Um, but again, what we are trying to figure out, why, why are people obedient? Um, what is the sense of power people have that will lead them to, to do things they might not normally do? Um, thinking about helping people out, when we see that there's no one coming forward and helping, we call that the bystander effect. And, and it's this mentality of someone else is going to help that person. Someone else is going to do things. Um, and so one of the key, um, 
real incidents, historical inter incidents with social psychology was the case of Kenny Genovese. She was attacked, brutally attacked outside a Brooklyn apartment complex. Um, 91 people had heard. Um, I think three pe or no one had called 911. Um, and everyone had this mentality someone else was going to be calling. Again, there were some cultural and some interesting historical things going on there during that time. Um, but it brought awareness to social psychologists to think more about that. So that's that idea of bystander. You can see in the slide.